Fred Kajalo's success comes from being a self-described contrarian. With wood as his medium, the Wilmer, Minnesota native blends patience, skill, and humor to create his award-winning sculptures. I think some people are just made to use their hands and they kind of, I was always drawn to wood and to, to tools. This was meant to be my refuge. People drive me nuts, I love them, but they drive me nuts. Fred's work is really multifaceted. It's high quality, it's an interesting material. He's a well-known Minnesota artist. He's capturing an everyday life in a very hyper-realistic way. People really see the high skill that's involved, so they can appreciate it on kind of a skill level as well as an aesthetic level. Instead of taking something like clay where you have both the option of putting it on and taking it off, readily with wood, you take your um, material and you pretty much remove it. My father died when I was quite young, but he'd left a uh, fairly well-equipped shop. So I was out there quite often trying to kill myself, doing bad things with the table saw. Working with disturbed adolescents, I had to uh, do one week of night watch every six week. After you did your rounds, your main job was to stay awake and there was a block of wood there that one of the kids had started carving on and had given up after rounding a corner and I thought I couldn't do any worse so I went and I took it and came back the next night with some of my father's carving tools as palm chisels and then I was off to the races. They're traditional edge tools. They tend to be gouges of various sorts and a gouge basically uh, just a U shape. And then there's your V tools and then your flat tools, which are your chisels, your firmers, and your skews. I designed a number of tools that were manufactured for a while, and I would say designed rather than invented, because basically you, you modify existing forms. I do photographic studies if it's a realistic thing, but I, I don't do any modeling in clay or anything else. I don't see the point of that. I figure if I do something twice, if I, I don't know what I want in some particular spot of a composition, I'll oftentimes leave a little extra wood there as I'm roughing things out in case something occurs to me as I'm doing it. So some of the design is usually on the fly. So this thing is titled, Don't Look Like Much of a Horse, and the subtitle is, Yeah, and You Ain't No Cowpoke Neither. And it's my tribute to my late brother. It's, it's an experiment in deep relief. Rules in relief are basically that you try to use as much of the actual depth available as possible for the most important elements and the foreground elements, and that you try not to have the eye object. When you're carving from a log, your problems with the moisture are such that you need to get rid of wood as fast as possible, otherwise it'll all split. The only stable way I know of doing it is to hollow them out. The face is sort of like a landscape, and you try to follow the contours of it. I'm just trying to cheat that line of the lip up just that little bit. Go back and modify this again when it's all said and done. I have more lumber than I'll probably use in if I live to be 400 years old, but yet I have this compulsive acquisition disorder and I can't uh, pass up a good lumber tree of some sort or other. People are fond of referring to me as a master woodcarver, and I'm really not because I'm not adept at a lot of the furniture carving and, and uh, decorative arts. There are even a lot of weaknesses in my human figures. The main thing is I try to get enough feeling and character. And these people seem to relate to them somehow. It would be a mistake to underestimate uh, Fred by saying it's kind of almost a pedantic rural craft or something that's just only about tradition. With the humor and the politics that are in the work, it's actually quite sophisticated. With carving, it's, it's a lot like getting married. You don't realize the full extent of your commitments until you're well into it. You have to live up to your commitments or else it's a messy divorce.
Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public.